Hello, and welcome to Jason Cavanis Experience. I'm your host, Jason Cavanis. The Jason Cavanis Experience is brought to you by Cavanis HR. At Cavanis HR, we deliver HR to companies with four or fewer people with our automated HR platform and while providing you an automated, while providing you a, a dedicated HR business partner. Our guest today is Candace Beats. Candace, you ready to be great today? Yes, I am. Candace is a co-founder and CEO at GiveSpace. She is also an active duty military spouse of almost 20 years and a mom of two. Her professional experience spans 20 plus years of nonprofit, community building, and marketing public relations experience. With Gift Space being her second entrepreneurial journey, she enjoys outdoors, traveling, coffee, ice cream, and is a lover of learning. She and her family have lived across four continents and currently call Hawaii home. Candace, thank you for being here today. I really appreciate it. Thanks so much, Jason, for having me on the Cavness uh, podcast. So, so Candice, um, on, on your LinkedIn, you did a company before called Alexander and Sophia, I think. Can you talk about that experience? That's that your first entrepreneurial um, yes. thing, right? Um, yeah, it was actually. Um, so Alexander and Sophia was a clothing brand that we branded and designed um, for children. So when uh, this came out of when I first had my first child and realized that there wasn't any kind of, um, everything kind of had little cutesy teddy bears or everything was really branded for girls um, or for boys, nothing kind of um, neutral that could go either way. And just, so I, I wanted to, my co-founder and I, um, for Alexander and Sophia, we wanted to create kind of a more modern brand. So that's that's what Alexander and Sophia did is it's um or was a children modern children's clothing brand and we did that set it up as an e-commerce worked with some incredible um, brand partners like honest company um and back then they were just starting out as well uh, freshly picked and then worked with you know groups like um guilt and zulily so that was how i first got into my first entrepreneurial journey and that's actually how Give Space was birthed. So then during that process, um, my co-founder and I thought, okay, we want to give back to a component for our communities, but there wasn't an easy way to do that for us. Um, it was really difficult actually to get in touch with nonprofits and which is not surprising because I do have uh, experience working with a lot of nonprofits in the past, but um, you know, as a nonprofit, you are very, strapped for time and usually staffing and funds. So uh, if you're not like a big brand that's going to offer uh, a large amount of dollars, the response limits that come through, you don't get back to them that quickly. So it took us about six months just to establish contact. And that was a really long time. We thought, why is it so hard to give back? And um, that was back in 2017 or so. So we worked through the process and, um, we thought, gosh, there's got to be a better way to do this. So came the idea, right? We started with this idea of give space. And let me tell you, when we finally decided to move forward and incorporate and move um, our resources to build out our the software platform for give space, when we presented this idea, it was people thought we were crazy. <laughs> so this was early in the beginning of 2020. Um, and then in March, right, COVID and the pandemic started. So we were kind of in that process of starting a new company when um, all of this, you know, now we're on what, year two um, of this pandemic. So it, we didn't know how this would go, but we kept, you know, we thought, okay, this is a good time for us to build. We're going to build this during this period. Um, but we, what we found is that there was so much change happening during that period. And for Give Space, I think the social demand for a product like ours um, was accelerated, you know, by at least five years. So now it feels like um, I wish, you know, we're always like fighting against time trying to get this built quickly and quickly. But good news is even today we got um, uh, we're now partners with shop, uh Shopify, which is a which is the world's largest e-commerce platform, so that launched um, today, which is super exciting for Give Space, and that's something we've been building here internally for the past, oh gosh, at least eight months now. So, 
day in and day out. Um, so awesome shout out to our CTO on that accomplishment. That was so, a long way to answer. <laughs> no, no, that's, that's great. So, I, I mean, I have to tell you, it's kind of surprising and disappointing that it takes so long for most nonprofits to get back to you. Like you think like customer service, for this, you think like for them being such short resource, the customer service, like the number one thing on, the, on their plate, right? To right. like bring in customers, bring in, you know, donations. That's kind of disappointing, to be honest with you. Yeah, it, I think it's because they're really focused on fulfilling their mission, which is doing the work that they are committed to doing, which um, is helping what you know, whichever segment of um, industry or customer base that they are supplying for. So, and I think especially, um, I think now we're seeing a lot more funding into that charity stream, but before it was even more difficult, right? So we have crazy statistics um, in 2020, you know, $305 billion was donated by individual donors. We're not talking about foundations. We're not talking about family um, philanthropies. We're just talking about individual donors like you and I, that was donated to charities, but companies on the other hand, only donated $28 billion. So you see a huge disconnect, right? And we know companies are now really focusing on that social impact, social responsibility piece. Um, so then the other layer of give space, this is what it's tackling now is companies are want to engage their own customers and their own consumers into deciding which funds that they want to give to, but there's no easy way to do that. So give space actually provides that solution for companies themselves. So now as they integrate give space, they can now um, give that responsibility of choice to their own customer segment and their customer segment um, will now decide where those charity dollars will go. So if they commit a 2% for their corporate social responsibility, um, instead of just as a corporation saying, hey, we're going to donate 2% to this X charity, um, now they can actually incorporate their customer um, input into where those dollars go. And they can do it per checkout if it's an e-commerce. Um, if it's a app product, they can do it um, post-purchase and have the consumer decide. Um, we integrate into other uh, e-commerce checkout carts. So there's a variety of options on how to get this integrated. Um, and then the other segment is uh, right now, so you have software companies that, you know, cater just to nonprofits or cater just to consumers, but there's no real 360 kind of ecosystem in this model. So um, that's the problem GiveSpace solves. It's um, we have a nonprofit portal that connects and nonprofits are just beneficiaries. They do not pay anything to use our platform. Companies utilize our platform to bring the connection between nonprofit customer and themselves. Um, and then customers themselves, they can create their own charity funds through our um, platform as well. So individuals, if you want to incorporate uh, a giving segment into your portfolio or into your tax dollars, uh, you could do that through GiveSpace as well. So is this something along the line where you go like, you go to like a store and you're, and you're, and you're, you know, checking out and they say, do you check? Yes. If you want to, you know, um, round up or you want to add a $2 to that? Is this like the same thing? Is this something different? Similar, um, very similar, but we don't operate point of sale. Um, we're all on the e-commerce end. Um, the difference is at those point of sale, the company still selects which charity, right? You don't get to say, well, I, I want to support um, Blue Star Families. You don't get a choice in where those dollars go, even though you're the donor. Um, similar to that, we have additional features. So um, companies can now run various campaigns to donate. So they can do a company funded, which means they're funding the entire thing. So every purchase, they're going to donate $3 of every checkout to your charity of choice, Jason. So now when you check out, you get to select the charity that that $3 that the company is paying for from your purchase, um, will go towards. Then they have fundraising, which is strictly, um, where the customer, just like you had mentioned, customer decides, yeah, I'm going to add a um, dollar to my purchase. And I want that dollar to go towards X charity. Um, and then there's a matching component when companies say, hey, we're going to match up to $10,000. Um, and then, you know, the 
customer donates and then the company will come back and do that match up to that amount. So your first company, Alexandra Sophia, that's shut down, right? It's not in business anymore? Correct. That is no longer um, operating. Can you talk about some reasons why you decided to shut it down? And then second part, talk about some of the lessons you learned the first time that are like making this one more successful for you. Yeah, definitely. So um, a few things with Alexander Sophia, we wanted a more sustainable um, business model. And if you look at fashion, um, I'm not familiar how sure you, uh, how familiar you are with the fashion industry, but um, it's actually difficult, right? Because you plan at least two seasons out pre before the season actually goes into retail and sales. Um, and at that time, when we started uh, back in 2012, it's better now because there's options out there. You had to bulk order and, you know, order your designs and, um, order all of the fabrics and get everything produced, um, then get your orders in from uh, your partners and your retailers, and then it goes into sale. So it's a long cycle. Um, it's also, you know, we realized that um, in fashion that you constantly have to come up with new designs. It, it has a lot of waste. Um, so those are things that we, wanted to veer away from and figure out a better model to um, move forward with. And so, you know, with Give Space, um, there's a huge sustainability component for us. Um, not only do we, you know, help companies meet their um, sustainable development goals, but our footprint that we leave behind is very minimal. And that's something that was really important to us as we grew as a company. Um, the second reason is um, we saw a potential, right, for a new market segment um, and holes in that segment that we knew we could gap. So um, I have the nonprofit and community building experience uh, behind me. Co-founder is uh, a former um, marketing executive for one of the top uh, three entertainment labels. And um, so she comes with, she has a powerhouse of experience and handles the digital marketing end. And then we were fortunate enough to round out our team with a CTO because we both don't have the technical skills um, behind us, but we do have the vision forward. So um, all of these things are things that we thought about in how we can better use our experience, talents, and um, vision, you know, in a world that we wanted to create for our kids growing up um, to, to create a product that has a longer shelf life and um, can help others while building. Yeah, I can't remember who it was, but I had a guest on a podcast a while ago. And her company was based on like uh, all the textile waste out there. Like people don't realize how much textile waste is out there, right? Because like yes. most people buy like, you know, new set of clothes every season or buy new shoes and they donate it. But where does the donation things really go? Or they throw it away. Like there's literally like, I can't remember the number, but like hundreds of means and maybe trillions of tons mm -hmm. of textiles just out there. Like a like that. What's that, what's that thing that we're talking about? The big uh, um, thing of plastic in the ocean that's like 10 tons yeah. or whatever, you know? It's just incredible the waste that's out there. It is. It really is. And I and you know we see a lot now, kind of reinventing that and um, finding more solutions in the textile waste. But it's still an enormous, you know, uh, I guess mountain to tackle. It, it, it's just and you know fashion is constantly evolving. So there's got to be a way. And I'm I'm being more mindful myself into creating a more minimal, but um, <laughs> I guess, classic pieces that will last a longer time rather than just going with trendy fashion. So Candace, one thing I admire about you, like you, 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 you use all the resources available. Like you've taken part in Blue Startups, uh, Founders Gym, PenFed, Patriot Bootcamp, Vets in Tech. I mean, and probably a host of others I don't really know about, right? Yeah. Can you talk about like, how do you go about finding these resources? How do you utilize them? Yeah. And what do you use to get, gain value from all those things? Definitely. Um, so I think I'll start off by saying um, the 
The military entrepreneur community, albeit small, is incredible. It's filled with resources. Jason, that's how I met you. Um, and I think that's a great way to, if you are um, involved in that community, a great way to get started. Uh, I think there's a community of, you know, baseline understanding of um, what we have all kind of experienced and have gone through. Um, and that feeling of community and helping each other and sharing resources. So I'm always happy to do that as well. Um, I think research uh, is really important. So I, I did, I actually started um, Give Space, you know, in conjunction by doing the Founder Institute program in Seattle. <clears throat> and that was great because I had never done a tech startup, right? I had and, an entrepreneur and experience. So one thing about Founder Institute, people don't know, it's like the early idea stages. Yes. I've never been through it, but everyone I know say this like a ground or like they, just, like, they don't destroy you, but like you better come correct. Like there's no boosting around. <laughs> there's no joking around. It's not, I'm doing this as a side hobby. You better be locked and loaded because yes. what I understand, they're going to destroy you if you're not yes. straight. Is that, is that true? That is a hundred percent true. Um, for where you are in the ideation phase of creating your company, um, Founder Institute was grueling, but also incredibly uh, resourceful. So it set us up to be able to uh, launch from there on. And I think one of the things as a, you know, being a military spouse and having moved so often, I have a large community at large, right? But haven't set roots somewhere where I can, um, where I have a community to just kind of reach out to, especially in the professional world. So that was really helpful for Founder Institute. Um, while I was, you know, figuring out mentors, advisors, trying to, you know, navigate that space in the tech industry where I felt like I didn't have the connections that I needed. Um, so that was also another great advantage is the network that they provide. Um, you know, I will say that there's probably, if there's a group of 25 entrepreneurs that start the program, only six to eight end up graduating. Yeah, so, that's our research. Yeah. And one thing I heard to everyone who graduates that I've known, they've always said it's like a you know, hard experience, but like it was the best thing for the company, right? It's like it yes. grew so much, like everyone just loves the process. If quote, you know, however common if they finish, right? Right, exactly. So, um, so we luckily finished the program and made it through. Um, and then from that, you know, launched other opportunities. So I think that was really um, the stepping point. Then I learned about, you know, Patriot Boot Camp, um, and then, through Patriot Bootcamp, I also learned about Founder Gym. And Patriot Bootcamp has connections with other, um, you know, resources. So through them, I received a Google for Startup scholarship to attend Founder Gym um, and did that course um, or cohort. Um, and then after that, um, applied for Blue Startups here in Hawaii and, um, thankfully was accepted into this latest cohort. We just finished our cohort in November. Um, and that this, that was another launching point for us. Um, the network there has been great. And that is a um, pre-seed accelerator program. So I went from, um, you know, ideation phase and then to the pre-seed. And then now, um, you know, here we are, we have two products now on the market and um, looking forward to 2022 with uh, a lot of growth opportunities for us. So I think it's safe to presume that you and I be real right now with all these uh, programs you took part in. Right. For me, it was, um, for me, it was pivotal. Uh, I think, you know, my, our co-founder has incredible networks in the uh, business development and customer base, which has been helpful for us. Um, but the actual, you know, lessons in starting, starting a new company and making sure you have the right boxes checked um, and, you know, being set up for 
you know, we're, we're looking at uh, raising venture capital funds uh, in the near future. So making sure all of those blocks are in line for us as we grow has been um, very, very helpful. So I know, I know that side of our business has a, um, we, we don't experience anytime we go through a due diligence, any kind of, you know, um, I guess setbacks. So Candace, back to nonprofits for a minute. Like, you know, a lot of people, they want to, you know, you know, give, donate money, to different nonprofits, whatever, but what, how can they best make sure the money's going to the right place? Right. Like, you know, there's horror stories, like for every dollar you give a certain nonprofit, they spend 95 cents on, you know, admin costs, you know, admin costs. Yeah. Is there some, some, some place people can go to see like how that's broken down? Sure. So we use um, Charity Navigator and GuideStar as our vetting points as well. Um, and they have, you know, those two entities are there just to do that. And you can look up the reports for almost every registered nonprofit there is um, and how they use their funds. They're even graded either by stars or by a grade rating. Um, and we, we do the double process of checking the nonprofits as well for give space um, with those two with charity navigator and guide star so that's one of the checkpoints that we also uh, filter our nonprofits through um, there are that's a really good point um, the other thing is I think grassroots organizations are really taking um, hold and doing a lot of great work regionally in the communities that you are residing in or have a special connection to. Um, and those may not have those ratings, but I think that, um, you know, as crazy as this sounds, the word of mouth and the, um, the social media um, aspect of those grassroots organizations are a good way to get a feel for the work they do on the ground. Um, and because it takes about a year, right, to go through that cycle of getting the ratings and the checks and the stars um, from these vetting organizations. So can you talk some about the challenges of being a non-tech founder and how you finally found your CTO? Uh, yes. So uh, it wasn't a, it wasn't, it was a hurdle in the sense that um, I didn't have the right terminology or knowledge um, of how to speak the tech lingo, but um, I knew that the groundwork then the framework for what we wanted, we could address and um, sketch out into a framework. Um, the challenge with finding a, if you're not from the tech space, it is challenging to find your technical CTO or your co-founder. Um, we were fortunate enough to have an introduction from someone we knew and um, a former colleague that introduced us to our CTO. And um, we worked together. So, you know, this is, you hear this advice a lot, in the entrepreneur community, it's um, before you get married, make sure you date a long time, right? <laughs> so, um, and that we're not talking about personal relationships, we're talking about working relationships. So we worked with um, our CTO for a good nine months before, you know, a solid nine months every, you know, having calls uh, multiple times weekly and uh, commencing on projects and showing deliverables. Uh, before we stepped into that agreement process. So, and it, it has to be mutually agreed upon and beneficial. And um, I think the most important thing is you want to make sure that person is as vested as you are into the project and the vision. And, um, and for us, we were very fortunate to find that. And so how did you make sure this person had the skills you needed? Like you know, a lot of people say, I can build this or do whatever, you know, but well, they actually don't know how to write. Right. How do you, how do you like make sure they had the tech skills that you needed? Um, I think, so when you initially, if you are, I would say work on a deliverable basis. So do it project-based where if they deliver a certain item, then the invoice comes and you pay it out. Um, don't do a full, you know, I'm going to pay a hundred percent of this upfront. Um, negotiate it. So you do the 30% initially, and then the 70% upon deliver, 
delivery. Um, and I think that's a good way to see like, okay, we can, this is what we asked for and we discussed, uh, make sure you get it all outlined in a document and then set timelines and goals and meet, um, you know, a few times a week and have them show you the progress as you go through the time. The difficulty is um, in the tech space, there's always bugs. So we learned that in the first few months, um, never, you know, fully the timeline that's initially agreed upon. You got to add in a filter there and add in an additional uh, few weeks for that. So, um, and I think that's a good way to test out, you know, the relationship. That way you're not investing all of the resources up front, but also demanding that they produce an outcome before um, you also invest. And then there's, um, I would also say if you, you know, through your networks, if you have someone that is proficient um, to also, you know, ask them to spare the 10 minutes with this person that you are talking to, your potential software developer or CTO, even if it's contracted to see if they do have the right skills. Um, and then as, as we learned, as you get further along in the process and you're looking to build out your team a little bit more on the tech end, um, during the interview process, give them a project that they need to finish. And um, you can do that. Our, our CTO was able to do that launch um, small projects where they have a certain time limit and then they have to complete that within that time limit. Um, and that was one of the ways we did our most recent uh, interviews. Candice, can you talk can you talk about how you how you educate yourself in tech? You know, like, you know, all the terms, you know, MVP, product market fit. Like you, yeah. you, you use the term bugs, people are like bugs, what like what do bugs gotta do with software, right? <laughs> right. Talk about how you educated yourself and got up to speed on the lingo, so to speak. Yeah. So you can read all the books you want, but <laughs> until you actually um start working on it and looking on it. So now I can actually go into a GitHub and um navigate the platform in a very minimal way. Um, but before I was like, what is GitHub, right? That's where you store all your codes and um, can launch development projects there. Um, I think for me, because I am such a um, learner that does, you know, learns by doing, and I love that. Um, for me, it was actually diving into the space with our CTO. And as he spoke to me in certain um, terminology and lingo, that's when, you know, everything that I've read on very basic startup language, um, software for dummies, is uh, where it kind of all started to click. So um, bugs, for example, are things that you run into when you write a code and then you're actually testing it, but there, it doesn't, the, the flow doesn't happen exactly, right? There's something that stop the flow, that's a bug. So you want to go back and fix that bug. So um, I think that's my, that for me, I think it depends on the type of learner you are. Um, so if you're more visual, maybe studying it more with um, an actual like coding platform in front of you. Um, but for me, it was actually working with our CTO, hearing him speak the terminology, going back and referencing. Um, and then it just, you know, all of these, all of these terms flow. Startup, startup world has a whole lingo term in itself, right? So that was another, that was another year of learning all the acronyms, just like when you're in the military and come in new, all the new acronyms that you need. So how have you dealt with this? Um, let's suppose you tell Bob a regular person, hey, Bob a regular person, I need you to get up and close the door. Bob's going to get up and close the door. But if you tell Bob the developer, you got to say, Bob the developer, get up at a 90 degree angle at 20% torque, you know, at this angle, this degree, all these minute details. How have you worked that, that like the communication? Mm, um, that is, that definitely has been a learning experience. Um, I've learned to be very detailed and it may not be exactly in that terminology, but when I, when we sit down and do our next phase of development or our next phase of um, product iterations, I learned to be very, very 
detailed and question every part of the workflow. So we'll go through the workflow and give every case scenario. And that's only learned through feedback from our um, beta users directly. So we're so grateful for them for that honest feedback. Um, they'll say, you know, things like even on the user experience end, right? They'll go through our platform. And for us, because we see it every day and we've worked through this for so long, it makes sense. It looks like, oh, why would you not understand that? But when you put it in front of someone, a new user, um, they'll come back and say, so exactly what should I select here? And we realize, oh, we need to make that explicitly clear in the description. So those are the things that we learned. Um, and then even in the workflow process, right? Because we handle so many different outputs of how you can use GiveSpace, every scenario almost has a a distinct workflow um, if, if you're choosing between those three categories I had mentioned earlier. So um, being very explicit and doing diagrams and sketches and going through various scenarios um, through that experience is really important. And some of those you won't catch until you actually have your, you have a beta user. So um, I think those two, in order to have a successful product and we're, we're iterating every day and finding new things to change every day and things that can always be better. Um, and it is because of those new experiences and getting in front of new users that we get that feedback. Um, and then I think, I think that, you know, selecting, um, sometimes you get too much feedback and not everything needs to be a fix right away. But when you see a pattern of everyone pointing out a certain thing, or you see a pattern of something that could be done better, um, I think those are definite immediate fixes that need to happen. So you live in Hawaii right now. And I think most people, when they think of tech and startups, I don't think anyone thinks of Hawaii. <laughs> Can you talk about the tech startup scene in Hawaii? Yeah, surprisingly, um, I think Hawaii is, through the pandemic, has realized that um, heavily that the economy needs to diversify, right? Um, not so solely based on hospitality and tourism and tech is one of the industries that is growing. Um, I think a lot of entrepreneurs and uh, tech executives also um, relocated to Hawaii during the pandemic. So that's caused an additional, you know, um, interest. I think through Blue Startups, their first company that went public um, in Hawaii also happened this past fall, um, Volta, they're a electric car charging company. They started 10 years ago here in Hawaii. Um, so I think, you know, there's definitely a lot of rumbling, a lot of rumble happening, um, in the past five years. And I think you will only see that growth happening even further. It's very exciting. It's an exciting time for Hawaii and, um, I think a lot of business leaders and um, innovators are, you know, here on island and abroad, um, you know, are taking a special interest. It's such a unique place for hospitality, tourism, sustainability. And I think all of these segments can tie into the tech space. How long is a flight from Hawaii to the States? Um, well, depends on where you are. Uh, West Coast, six hours, five to six hours. And then... Um, to the East Coast, nine to 12 hours, depending on the headwind. Okay. So next, um, talk about leading remote teams. And then how do you, what's your process of making sure some of you want to bring on a team can actually do remote work? Because I'm a firm believer everyone cannot do remote work. Yeah. It's a skill set to it. Definitely. I agree with that. And, you know, my husband will agree with that too. He is a definite, I'm a hybrid at best. So um, I think, I think you have to assess your team and personalities are very important. And um, I've remotely worked for, gosh, um, 10 years now. I've led remote teams for almost eight years. So um, that was a, I would say a definite positive and benefit during, you know, this time of when we all had to migrate to remote for a while. Um, but I think you have to assess and address the needs of each individual employee. And I think that that whole space of um, your workforce, you know, that's all getting revamped um, as well. But some people thrive in remote 
right uh, capacity, others hate it. So um, because of the situation of where we are, we we state first that we are remote first. Um, I think we don't. We need to make that clear and make sure that um, you know people who we want on our team know that we're remote first. Um, you know, eventually as we grow and can have a headquarter space, um, I think that will also be hybrid and not fully, um, you know, in office. Of course, they have the option to do that, but um, we will always offer that flexibility. But currently we are remote first and we make that explicitly known so that they know if that's the right fit for them. And I think, um, you know, I, I think people now can make that determination, especially after a year and a half of having that experience, if it's the right fit for them or not. So you've worked in the private sector, non private public. Can you talk about the difference to each one? Like, was your was your process to work in these places the same, or you had to change it up? Can you talk about that some? Um, I think so. There's definitely a different culture in each segment, um, and you know, there are a lot of similarities. And I think the, the baseline similarities are all there, right? Um, yeah, I, adequate, um, uh, oh goodness. So, you know, respect, um, having empathy for your team and leading with a um, very focused, um, a focused and very, I guess, uh, driven, focus-driven model of what deliverables you want at a certain period of time and um, setting those parameters. Uh, I think across the board, that's good. Um, I, I think some, you know, the startup space is definitely its own culture. Um, something that I had to Get more familiar with myself. Uh, it's 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 the most it's hardworking people, um, but they're also very casual. So I wasn't used to that. Right, coming from um, when I first you know worked with different nonprofits or with uh, in in corporate or um, in education. So that was different. I came from a much more formal. Um, so that took some getting used to, I remember that thinking, oh, I can be a lot more casual in this space, um, even in the way I converse. Right. So, um, so I, I would say that's, that's kind of a cultural difference. It may not be in every case, but, um, that's in my experience, what I experienced, uh, I think with, you know, public and, um, public sector, there's a lot more bureaucracy, lots of layers of approvals and, um, because you're dealing with public funds. And then in education, a good balance of um, incorporating, you know, student, parent, and educator plus admin and um, your faculty and staff. So yeah, it, it's, it's interesting. And I, I think I'm grateful for having all of those experiences. Next, can you talk some about being a, mil being a military spouse? Uh, yeah. Of course, what I, that's goodness. Um, it's, I think it's a difficult one to explain. Um, and I think it's one that going through it, uh, you have a community there that I, the ups and downs you go through as a military spouse, um, the unexpected is always there. So. I think there, a community like ours has um, a lot of resilience. I know that word is used so frequently, but for a reason. Um, I think we're all in some way, uh, you know, uh, for me, there's a lot of things where, you know, I think, oh, well, no problem, right? Because we can adapt and easily adjust to something. Um, when you're having to be taken out of your comfort zone so often and so frequently and reinvent yourself each and every time, uh, there's a certain understanding that you just create, right? For your, for your surrounding environments, uh, your surrounding communities, your surrounding um, 
demands, your surrounding, you know, uh, needs. So I think, I think that is, um, that builds a certain character and, um, you know, you say one difficulty, right? When you read or learn about certain traits that help develop a person, when you go through that so often, um, you know, sometimes I, I think, you know, I hear a lot, whoa, how do you do that? So currently I'm going through this water crisis with no fresh running clean water. Um, and we're currently in a hotel situation and then also having a startup <laughs> and then also um, juggling two kids, right? So there's a lot and, um, but you just do it and you just roll with it and you keep moving forward. And I think there's, you know, when I think about, when I actually pause and think about, oh my gosh, okay, 11 moves um, in almost 20 years, right? That's how it, you know, and we're talking across countries and states. And then also sometimes it's, couple moves within the same um, duty station. So there's there's a lot, uh, I think, there that we're constantly having to jump up and uh, figure things out and grab all the moving pieces and lay them all down. Um, give me a week and I can settle into a new location with a whole new environment and, you know, have my kids settled. So we're at that point. Um, but when you think about it, it's very stressful. Um, so there's no time to stop and think. You just have to keep moving. <laughs> And one thing I just thought about, I never thought about before because my wife took care of all the other stuff. Like, but every time you move, you know, you have school age kids, she has to be concerned, okay, how do I find the best you know, school for my kids, right? You might go from one school that's top notch and move somewhere else that's not that great, right? Mm -hmm. And I, I, just, I just thought about that because certain parents have, especially on the stress spouse, going to a new school and, and making new friends and all that kind of stuff is a stressful thing, too, I would say. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, the kids, I think you, you have, kids too, who grew up, um, you know, moving every so often, they are, they are also, gosh, so resilient, but they don't know a different life other than this, right? So if you grew up in this, this is all you know. And um, there's a part of me that holds a lot of mom guilt for that. Like, they don't know what it's like to have a stable group of friends that have been with them um, through this, right? They have long distance relationships with friends for a long time, but not that every day, you know, I grew up with a, a core set of friends that, you know, I grew up with and they don't have that, not even with their extended family. So um, we do our best to act, keep certain groups and segments, you know, and if you have, because you've gone through that process, other advice you can offer, uh, I have a middle schooler and one that will is in preschool, so quite an age gap there as well. Um, yeah, I think two things is like people don't realize like you move around a lot versus someone who's there all the time. If they're all the time, you're gonna have the same coaches, team, same teammates. You know, if you're playing sports, you know where. Mm -hmm. If you move somewhere else in ninth grade, you got a previous all over. You, you, you might have been the greatest running back, or best basketball player, best whatever your previous school. Right. No one knows your new place, right? You got to prove yourself. It's gonna take yeah. time to you know get rid of the person. Another thing too, uh, you know, like people don't realize this. Another sacrifice you make. Of course, you know, people talking about the deployments, all that kind of stuff, you know, moving. Like, like my family, like, um, like no one already ever saw my kids play anything in school, right? I never saw right. my niece and nephews play stuff in school. You know, we never did Thanksgiving as a family. It's always a different place. Like, and, and you miss all that stuff, right? Right, exactly. And I think that that's what's most frustrating for our oldest is that every time she has to move, she has to prove herself again and then again. So... Uh, as she gets older, I see that frustration um, in, you know, that's the frustration. She doesn't mind so much the new environment or the new house or, you know, having the opportunity to experience a new place, but she definitely gets frustrated with the fact that, oh, I have to do this all over again and start from zero again. So um, that's a great point, Jason. I agree with that. Has this ever happened to you? So we were stationed in Italy. And so we left Italy and, and flew to Dallas, Texas for a two-week vacation, right? You know, do all those flights to, uh, get over here? Yeah. And like, and of course, like some relatives will say, hey, when are you going to come visit me? You know, I'm 30 minutes away. Like, are you kidding me right now? Like, seriously, <laughs> did you just say that? We've flown like literally hundreds of miles and hours and all this stuff, bringing three young kids and you can't drive 30 minutes. Has that ever all happened right. to you? Oh, yeah. <laughs> all the time. 
<laughs> all the time. And, you know, I just say they just don't know. Right. That's how I get through. They just don't know. Um, so, yeah, but it is definitely like so exhausting. And sometimes you're right, like even taking that trip to visit family when you kind of need to decompress from, you know, life as it is, um, is it's actually stressful. <laughs> So what's something about military spouse life that you think the general public doesn't know? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, uh, I think the positive is they don't know how strong the bonds are across our community. Um, I think we all go through a certain experience like deployments um, or losing a service member from our unit or um, those experiences that they don't get to experience. And uh, there's a really powerful and strong bond there. On the negative side, just like you had mentioned, just those little things like not being able to um, have any of your family visit your kids' sporting events or um, visit schools or um, be a part of their everyday life, right? They'll never really get to experience any part of that. So those are kind of, I think, um, even the little things, I think people take that for granted, right? Or not being able to go see my, um, my nephew or my nieces in certain aspects of their life. So yeah, I, I think, you know, I think sometimes those, those little things are the things that are most um, not seen. I think we hear a lot about military unemployment, military spouse unemployment or, um, military spouse hardships of, you know, deployments, but we never hear about, or we don't hardly um, hear about the little everyday things that we miss out on. Here's something crazy. So, you know, we were stationed in Germany, Italy, all the, all the world. Mm -hmm. Only one person came to visit us. My wife's sister came, came to visit us while we were in Korea. Only time someone came to visit. And you think we're in Italy. I was like 30 minutes from Venice. <laughs> like, <laughs> surely you can afford like a plane trip or something, right? To uh, but someone, someone came to visit in Seoul, Korea, yeah. Not Germany, not Italy, not all of Europe, yeah. No, we're wrong, Seoul's a great place. Yeah. A lot of stuff to do, but you're just like, yeah. yeah. Right, yeah. Um, fortunately, we've had, you know, my sister and her family visit us at almost every duty station several times. Um, but that was, you know, and uh, yeah, and certain members of our family, but the majority have never, ever, no matter where we are, a cool place in the world, um, don't, haven't made the trek. So do most other, most other military spouses get what you do? They get you're an entrepreneur and you're doing a startup or like, why is Candace not volunteering at this function for the unit? <laughs> yeah, I took a step back from that uh, these past few years. And I think, I think the whole kind of space is a little evolving. Um, you know, I think before you'd see, and, and still, don't get me wrong, Jason, the majority are um, strictly military spouses, right? They uh, don't want, you know, for some reason, there's a huge disconnect between employed or entrepreneur military spouses versus um, just yeah, military spouses who are dedicated to home, which is either way is fine. Um, but the majority the culture here is still where, um, gosh, you know, how do I say this? It's still all catered to um, the expectation of military spouses holding down the home front. So um, when certain things happen or we have a, a crisis situation or there are, um, unit activities happening, they're all catered towards um, the, you know, the stay at home military spouses, they don't take into account or often do not take into account um, spouses who may be working or um, so that's, I, I think, you know, speaking on that and, uh, you know, just making it known that you are a working military spouse um, helps kind of change that paradigm a little bit. Um, it's something I, I always have to kind of interject um, because if there's 10 of us, you know, in a group, there's only one or two of us that are actually um, 
working. So I think, I think more and more though, there's definitely a, um, will be a culture shift in that. So what's your opinion on this? And we'll focus on military spouses community, but you can, you can talk about any community anywhere. And this is my opinion. It's like, you know, there's like use like one or 2% of people like you, like doing great things, trying to make the war better, like doing extra stuff. And most people are like, oh, we'll be me. I, I can't change my circumstances. The war is against me. Why do you think some people like have their drive and some people don't? Oh, I don't know. That's a question. I, I don't know. I think um, a lot of it, I, I don't know. <laughs> I can't answer that question. I would say um, from my experiences in a lot of nonprofit training is that um, sometimes if you have a difficult background um, or come from um, a more disadvantaged, I guess, uh, landscape, then there are certain things that um, you feel are very far-fetched to reach. Um, but a lot of it is, you know, I, I honestly, I don't know, but I think having, you just, know that you, that, you just know that you have it right. Yeah. The internal motivation I think is, um, important, but I also think you need to have mentors or opportunities or someone believing in you or telling you, you can do it. Um, so that's something yeah, it's something I'm always actually on the side thinking about when I think about, um, you know, our school age children and how they are developing right into um, this next as they grow because of, you know, the age and what I see, you know, in the different school systems that we have been through um, with my daughter and how certain, you know, how certain schools really push that drive. Um, and that language into their everyday um, and how certain schools don't. And it's a very negative. So I don't know if that has something to do with it, um, but that's a really good question. I wish I knew the answer to that question. <laughs> so Candace, next, can you talk about how you build community? Um, I think community, the first thing is it has to be authentic. So I think if you are, you need to either have a distinct passion because of an experience you went through to build a certain community base, um, or you need to be a member of that community to build the community. I, I think trying to build a community because you have alternate um, agendas is always going to fail. People are gonna see through it. So um, truly being able to connect and having a, personal connection to building that community, I think is uh, key and essential. Um, you're either, you're, and then also if you're depending, right? So I've done community building uh, as a volunteer and then also in my professional uh, career. And I have never taken a professional community building um, mission without having a direct personal connect to that because I think it's really difficult to build that. So, um, and sometimes it's just having the understanding and providing the space for others to come in and build that community from where you started, right? So, um, but I think that that distinct understanding of that community has to be there. And that's challenging for a lot of um, companies. So, you know, we get this question a lot. Um, that's why I think diverse teams are so important, um, whether it's having, you know, gender diversity or whatever diversity, um, because certain things you can see, but you can't directly relate to. Um, and in order to build an authentic community, you need to be able to understand the needs of that community and the desires of that community from not just one angle, but from various different angles and experiences. So, so Candace, you know, you're a mom, a wife, you're, you're being a startup, you're doing this water crisis. I'm sure you have other things going on on a daily basis. Like uh, let's say you have a pride list of one to 100. How do you make sure on a daily basis you focus on priorities one, two, and three versus going to priority number 92? 
Right. That's really important. Um, I do a um, actual, a, you know, a vision board that does the priorities, overall priorities of every segment of my life. Um, so that's a personal, professional give space board. Um, and that is the overall vision, right? And then I also have a daily to-do task list. And these are to-dos that I must do um, in order to sustain, you know, all of my different roles in life. Um, and then I have my weekly and then, uh, and then company to-do list, right? Of um, whether it's, you know, writing an updated newsletter or <laughs> um, getting the next, you know, interview for the next blog post. So um, for our, our internal blog, and it's, um, I think for me, lists are key. I could not operate without my lists. And I'm also a very paper and pen list person. So everything will, you'll see a lot of um, everything written and then checked off. And for me, that's how I prioritize what needs to get done now, you know, within this week, and then within this month, and then overall for the year. So for me, it's very visual and it's very hands-on. So Candace, you know, some people know famously work 100 hour weeks. Some people don't work weekends. I know someone who works like 21 days in a row and take four days off. <laughs> How do you work your schedule? That's a good question. Um, I have seasons. So I worked, you know, um, really long hours during our push for you know, giving Tuesday and beyond through the holiday season and then took like a week and a half off of just hardly like just checking my email once a day for a few hours and that's it. Um, so I'll push really hard and then take time to wind down and make sure I have the time to wind down or I get burnt out. Um, but I don't have like, I don't work weekends or anything like that. I think that's really hard as a startup founder to, um, for me, for to not, for to do that. Um, I just have to find, you know, time and hours, but I do make sure for my, for my sanity that I do block off certain segments of time where I kind of, um, give myself time to rejuvenate and uh, refocus. So how about you, Jason? How do you <laughs> juggle your time? Uh, I, I, I probably suck at that, right? Because I'm always working with you. So I'm, but I try my best at least once a week to take a two-hour break, right? Like yesterday, I went, I went to dinner with my niece for a couple hours. Oh, that's I might nice. have a beer with a friend, you know. I always try to, like, you know, like, do small things, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yes, I can. Yeah. And that's, yeah. I, I, I could say there are days when I'm, like, you know, replying to emails at 3 a.m. And that's just what it is. And then, but there are days when I'll take a full day off, you know, um, and just uh, have fun with my kids. So yeah, I think balance is good. I'm working towards a better balance. <laughs> like last October, like a friend of mine invited me to go elk hunting with him here in Washington. I'd never been to hunt, cool. elk hunting before, yeah. right? But I have all this stuff going on. I really can't afford to take off. There's be no internet, no nothing. But when and will I ever get a chance to go elk hunting again? Right. Probably never, right? So, you know, those, you gotta, you know, balance it some kind of way. You yeah. Know, like, so Kenneth, next, how do you take care of yourself? Like how you make sure you don't burn out, how you take care of your wellness, all that kind of stuff. Mm. So uh, for me, I like silent time, meditation time is key just for five minutes every day. Um, because I am, you know, juggling being a mom of two kids and they're involved in their activities. And um, this past week had to readjust to having them home again after, um, because of all the COVID stuff happening. And then um, also, you know, my husband's an active duty, um, it, you know, he's an active duty soldier. So he works crazy hours. I, I take, I do most of all the things on the home side. Um, and then being a co-founder and CEO of a startup, that's, that never stops. Um, so that silent time of even just five minutes a day is for me, um, something I need to focus and ground myself in the day. Um, I also, I love, uh, when I get a chance to just take a hike. Uh, I think Hawaii has been such a blessing for that because there's so many outdoor opportunities here. Um, so that I try to at least 
get out and do something outdoors, whether it's in the ocean or in the mountains, at least once a week. So next, you, you've been in four continents and done a lot of traveling, of course. Do you have a, fa a favorite place that you want to go back to visit? Mm. Um, I would say there are so many favorite places, but I would say the most memorable experience for me um, was a was visiting the Middle East because it was so vastly different from anything I had been exposed to. Um, and, you know, not to say it was good or bad in any way, it was just so different and eye-opening for me um, to feel the different feelings I had about, you know, um, how to be embedded into a culture that I did not have a familiarity about um, as I thought I had. It was, it was just such a learning experience at every turn. So for me, that was, um, that was an incredible trip. Um, and, oh gosh, I would love to go back to experience other parts of um, that region. Is there a place you've been to where you actually liked it? But most people are like, you like this? Like, that's crazy. Why do you like this place for? Like something off the, off the wall, random place. Mm, interesting. Um, no, I think, I, I don't know. I find, uh, I find joy in almost every new place or uh, new experience. So I think maybe it's just who I surround myself with, but they feel the kind of the same way, right? So they enjoy everything that's different about a certain uh, travel experience or a cultural experience. So Candice, you always talk about the sun, but can you go into more detail about how you start a gift space, what you're focused on right now and what your vision is for the future of the company? Yeah, sure. Um, well, our vision this year is to um, expand our customer segment. So with this new launch um, uh, in Shopify, we will be able to um, really branch out into e-commerce, uh, which is exciting for us. And then looking at partnerships in other sectors like travel and hospitality and tourism. Uh, I think a new, new wave of um, sustainable and giving back as you travel, learning about uh, organizations that are making differences and the struggles that each um, region may experience. I think that's really important to a conscious traveler. Um, and, you know, as we grow Give Space, our vision is to create new experiences for both the companies and in turn their customers. And I, I think that's what's most important and will create an authentic um, community for each of those segments. And what I mean by that is, you know, we hear of new ways to experience um, life, right? So I want to make sure that Give Space also offers that opportunity in a way that gives back. Um, so not just here's a dollar, um, but hey, let's see what our collective dollars have done and having you know the nonprofits more involved in the process so they can um, showcase you know how we've all partnered together into making an impact in you know certain communities and our goal is to really highlight grassroots um, work and opportunities that the grassroots organizations are doing and um, listening to the end customers so that our companies customers themselves and helping our companies build out, you know, that those requests. Um, and that's kind of, that's kind of our vision for Give Space is uh, we want to, you know, our tagline is powering the world to give back together. And we want to be a tool that um, builds into all of these segments so that we all feel like we're connected and not segmented off trying to make an impact in our in our world. So Candace, I'm guessing that you just didn't call up Shopify one day and say, let's work together. Can you talk a little bit about how that partnership, so to speak, came about, like the work and stuff you had to do for that? Yeah, so um, our, the easy, or not the easy, but the most fruitful, I guess, part, even for the companies 
um, of using gift space is seeing how the nonprofits, right? Seeing how the companies and their consumers have, you know, chosen and given back some of these dollars to a certain nonprofit and to see the work that's been done with those dollars um, is most rewarding, right? Like, oh my gosh, we actually, this actually had an impact. It wasn't just a checkout. Um, and really building that experience and segment in is our next, um, is our goal for 2022. And um, that really happens when you can develop these really close knit partnerships with the nonprofits and give them easy tools for the nonprofits to utilize as well. So, and that's, that's a segment that um, we are product building right now. Can you talk about this? And this is something I have a problem with, right? Like you're a star founder, you're, you know, in the weeds, you know, you're dig, you know, ground every day. How do you make sure that you stop and, you know, you know what, I actually have made progress. I'm, I'm far ahead than I was six months ago or a year ago. You know, I'm actually doing, I'm actually making progress I need to make. How do you make sure you, you, you do that? Mm, that's really good. Um, there are times when you feel like you're stuck in a rut and just running on the wheel and um, you forget to look up, but there's days like today, for example, when you've hit a milestone that you've been working on and you can stop and then look around and look and see, oh my gosh, we were able to, um, you know, just with our beta trials this past month, um, complete donations of over $12,000 into charities. Um, and then now we built, completed this new product and it's launched. So today was my day to come up, look around and really celebrate and, um, take time to do that. So I think, I think you have to have those milestones. And once you reach them, you have to take the time to like, stop and look and congratulate the entire team on the progress because no one ever gets there alone. So there's something else I struggle with too is patience. Like as an entrepreneur, I think you have to have patience. Like, you know, the myth is, you know, get an idea six months later, you're, you're, you're casting the big money, right? Right. <laughs> you talk about the importance of having patience and knowing that's actually a long term. It's like a um, marathon, not a sprint. Yeah, it's definitely a marathon. Something, yeah. And that's something I'm learning every day. Um, and I, I, my personality is, you know, I'm, I kind of have a perfectionist personality and I, I'm very goals driven and, you know, um, vision driven. So, and I, and I, you know, drill those things into our team too. And um, thankfully I have, our core team is so good at, you know, you need to let's stop and refocus and see how far we've come. And I think that's so important. You just mentioned that too, Jason. Um, and I think having people surround you that you trust and that know you well enough and you know them and know the quirks and ins and outs um, is also very important to have that, to have that around you to, um, you know, refocus when you need to, or to focus when you need to, or um, pause when you need to, get input when you need, uh, feedback when you need. I think those things are all really important. Um, and yeah, I, I could say I could attribute all of that to the team as well. We do that for each other and um, we check each other and we balance each other and make sure that there's time to breathe and there's time to, you know, sprint when we need to sprint and there's time to, long, you know, take a long jog <laughs> so Candace, you know, you always hear, you know, if you're an entrepreneur or star founder or the case be, you know, never quit, keep grinding, you know, keep on going, going, whatever, you know, case be. But is there a time uh, someone should stop? You should, should, should startup entrepreneurs have like a quote unquote, like a red line? Mm. I think yes. And I think no, I think there's many times already, right? Um, a year and a half into this of me thinking, oh gosh, there's days when I'm like, should we just stop? Should we just stop? Um, but I also know internally it's, there's also people on the other end, depending on you. Um, and I'm talking about both internally and externally with customers. And, um, and I think that's a personal, really, really personal decision. I think that's not an easy one. Um, but for us and for me, the voice internally is always, 
you need to keep going because when I hear stories of nonprofits or when I hear stories of companies or when the feedback is, oh my gosh, this worked and it worked so much better than we had anticipated. We're so excited. Um, that's like, okay. And the more you get that validation from external um, users, customers is for me, that's the validation that, okay, we are, we are building this to make a difference. And, um, you know, that's, that's why we started give space in the first place. So, um, yeah, I, I think as long as the need is there, um, you know, and we're very frugal, I'm very frugal with our funds. <laughs> My team will tell you that. And so there's a good, um, you know, and I haven't as a founder myself, I've invested into the company, but haven't been, um, you know, there's also that time when you have to gauge personally, right? I think that personal gauge of, okay, I've worked on this for how long and there's no, I also need um, to survive. So there's, there's that, there's so many things to consider, I guess. So that's a very a hard question to under, I guess, answer for everybody. But for me, um, yeah. I know we're still going strong. <laughs> yeah, my biggest fear is if I quit, like and then and like a week later, someone call me up. What are you quit for? I was about to invest money in a company, or yeah. <laughs> you know, get you know hundreds of customer calls. We're about to sign up, right? And he's like, you know, what's that that meme where like guys you dig in the in the in the, uh, uh, the diamond mine and he stops one hit before the diamonds and someone takes it from him and gets all the yeah. diamonds? I mean, that's, yeah. that's my biggest fear. So, yeah. so Candice, is there anything I should ask you that it didn't, or anything else you want to talk about? Um, well, Jason, you've been doing this a lot longer than I have. So I'd love to hear your answer to, you know, that, that question, if you have one, like when, when do you know for, as an entrepreneur? Um, I think a lot of it is like, you know, is external driven. Like for me, my real line was given to, to me by my wife. Like mm -hmm. we're not going to mortgage a house. Right. So, right. Like, <laughs> so it came down, like I had to get mortgage a house, get more money. Yeah, it's, it's as a wrap, right? Yeah. The question ever like, you know, like, you're working, you might have a personal family emergency, maybe someone gets cancer or, you know, mm -hmm. something bad like that happens. Right. You never know external is going to happen, right? Or maybe, yeah. I mean, like example, there's a guy in Bunker Labs named Ben Boyer. He has a tech, he had tech consulting company doing well. Mm -hmm. He wants to love to do. He got offered a job. He accepted it. Now he's in charge of, I can't remember the title, but basically mm -hmm. he's a director of uh, army. Some, basically what he does at GM, he mm -hmm. finds startups doing stuff in the tech space to build like military vehicles, right? Oh, cool. Like a dream job, right? So yeah. maybe something like that, that comes along, right? Right. Like, you know, right. and like, what does it say? Everyone has a price. I mean, mm -hmm. maybe you're struggling two or three years, you know, you're tired of eating peanut butter sandwiches or ramen noozy, right? Your right. spouse are like, <laughs> what are we doing, right? And some offer you like a job, like out the world, you know? I'm just, you just never know, right? Right, and, exactly. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, Bye. go ahead. Um, so I forgot to ask you in the pre-talk, but do you have any kind of gift or resource you want to give away? Some people do, some people don't. You can maybe a link to your beta test or what do you, what do you want it to yeah, be? Yeah, definitely. If um, any company would like to try Give Space, we're happy to offer uh, free betas and um, we're actually launched now. So uh, if you have a Shopify e-commerce store or um, any kind of uh, e-commerce presence, marketplace um, where you'd like to give back and or have your customers give back with you, um, and donate to causes that matter to both of you, we'd love to, I'd love to, you know, extend the um, free month trial for anybody who wants to try it, no cost. And then, um, yeah, and any, I guess, early entrepreneurs that uh, would like to, you know, have to connect or get any feedback or I'm happy to do that as well as time allows. So, um, I think the best that, way that, that, that caveat, right. As time allows. Yeah. As time allows. <laughs> I do try to always, um, I, I do try to mentor, um, at a few hours every month. So definitely, um, I think that's important. And I know I wouldn't have, I wouldn't, wouldn't be here now without the generosity of mentors, um, that I reached out to. So I always want to give back that support as well. Um, so yeah, I, I think any of those offers work. Um, if you mention 
Jason Kavanagh's experience um, through our website or uh, through LinkedIn, I'm happy to send over a, a link for that. Candace, how do you do the situation or what do you do in the situation? So if someone emails you say, hey, I gave X amount of money to this nonprofit through gift space and they, it's a totally rip off. Is that something you get involved in or how does that work? Sorry, the, it froze on me for a few okay. minutes. I think it was the internet on my end. I apologize. No worry. So is that, if someone emails you or calls you, hey, you know, I gave X amount of money to this nonprofit. It's a total rip off. It's a scam. I lost my money. I want, I want my money back or something, something along those lines. It's something you do with, you say, no, that's genuine, they're not profit, or how's that work? Um, if they use our platform, then all of our nonprofits are vetted and um, they are all verified 501c3 charities. Uh, so I, I don't, you know, we've done our checks and balances for that. Um, so I, I'd love for them to, you know, contact me so we can dig into that further. Um, but, but well, yeah, if it's done for our platform, low, then. how does that happen? We haven't, knock on wood, gone through that experience yet. <laughs> great, great. Hey, Candice, can you share, share your social media links for you and your company so people can reach out to you? Sure. Um, LinkedIn is uh, Give Space Co. Co. Or personal is Candice Dietz, and that's C A N D I C E D I E T Z. So. Um, and those are probably the best ways to reach us or via email at info at givespace.co. And to our listener, we have the links to her um, gift and social media links on our show notes. You can find the show notes at www.cavernishrblog.com. And be sure to share this episode with your networks and be sure to subscribe to the Jason Cavern Experience on your favorite, favorite platform. So um, we're coming to the end of our talk, Candice. Can you give us any last minute advice and wisdom on anything you want to talk about? Uh, well. I think as we head into a new year, um, if you haven't done so already, I think a vision board is very powerful. So I would suggest that as a tool, um, you know, regardless of where you are or what roles you have in your life that you're fulfilling, um, I think that's manifesting something that you see and desire for the year and for your life. Um, for me, it's been a very powerful, um, powerful thing. And I think, and place it somewhere where you can see that and hold yourself accountable for that. Um, I, I, that's just kind of as, as this is the new year, a uh, little, a little, uh, tidbit I want to pass on. Um, and then the other thing is, I think we fail sometimes really to, uh, set boundaries and I'm worth, this is something I'm working on myself. Um, to really hold, you know, things that are important to you, but, and make time for things that are important to you and say no to things that don't fulfill that right now. And that can change over time. For example, like the mentoring hours, um, for me, that's very important. And I want to add, and I add that in, um, uh, a few hours every month. So, um, I think that's important, um, to do that and always, be open to um, meeting and talking to people who may have a difference in opinion or thought than you. Um, I think some of my greatest learning opportunities has been from those conversations. Candice, thank you for your time today. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Jason. It was great speaking with you. And to our listeners, thank you for your time as well. And remember to be great every day.